Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Mark Steiner. Great to have you with us once again. On September the 15th, 2008, the financial meltdown began with the bankruptcy of the Lehman Brothers. That was 10 years ago, obviously. The shockwaves that hit the economy threw 9 million families out of their homes who could not afford to pay their rising mortgages. So Congress and the President in the 1990s, remember, killed Glass-Steagall, written in 1933 to save us from the excesses of the financial industry. And then Congress gave us Dodd-Frank in the wake of the 2008 crisis that bailed out Wall Street, but not America. And now Trump seems to continue the process with killing Dodd-Frank and completely turning over the keys to Wall Street. Our guest today says, in part, we must wipe out debt and not bail out the banks. So with that, let me welcome back to Real News, Michael Hudson, Research Professor of Economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and a Research Associate at the Levy Economics Institute at Bard College. His latest book is J is for Junk Economics. And Michael, welcome. Good to have you with us. Good to be here. So let's start there um, with this whole idea of what we did wrong in 2008, why we got it wrong, and what we should have done from your perspective. Well, all of the, you're talking about uh, September 15th, and if you talked about last weekend, the 10th year anniversary, all that you've read in the New York Times and uh, other newspapers was a celebration. We did everything right. We bailed out the banks. Uh, there is very little discussion of the fact that this is a disaster for the economy. Uh, it, uh, nobody has related the fact that we bailed out the banks on their own terms to the fact that the economy has not recovered. People talk about a recovery since 2008. Just to put this whole issue in perspective, almost all of the growth in GDP, which they look at, has taken the form of higher bank earnings, which they call financial services, meaning penalty fees, late fees, and uh, interest rates over and above the bank's uh, cost of uh, funds, uh, and uh, rising rents that homeowners would have to pay themselves if they rented instead of uh, owned their homes, and as uh, you've had so many, uh, you mentioned nine million homeowners lost uh, their homes, they now have to rent. Rents are rising, uh, debts are rising, uh, the uh, corporate debt, municipal debt, and student debt are way higher now than uh, 2008, and most of this is because uh, of the way in which President Obama double-crossed his voters and said, I'm not representing you, I'm representing my donors. Uh, and he invited the bankers to the White House and said, don't worry, folks, I'm the only guy standing between you and the mob with pitchforks. Uh, just like uh, Hillary called uh, uh, Donald Trump uh, uh, supporters, uh, uh, the word uh, uh, that she used, he called his supporters the mob with pitchforks, and he stuck it to them. Uh, uh, in my book, uh, Killing the Host, uh, you have Barney Frank, saying that he'd got uh, uh, the agreement of uh, Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Hank Paulson, to write down the mortgages to uh, the uh, realistic charges, namely, number one, what the mortgage borrowers could uh, afford out of their income, and number two, to uh, the carrying charge of the mortgage would be the going rent rate, which is what mortgages uh, historically have tended to. Uh, Obama said, no, I'm representing the bankers, not the debtors. And uh, he appointed uh, bank lobbyists, uh, such as uh, uh, Citibank's uh, uh, Tim Geithner, the Secretary of the Treasury. He basically followed uh, everything that uh, President Clinton's Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Rubin, uh, recommended to him. Uh, he was handed the list. Here are the people that uh, we want to appoint. Uh, and uh, he did it, washed his hands of it. And uh, the, the terms of the bailout, instead of uh, doing what normally happens in a crisis, writing down the debts uh, to, uh, and writing off the bad savings and the bad loans as the counterparts to the debts, in, instead of taking over the insolvent banks, he kept everything on the books. Uh, there was a big argument within the administration. Surprisingly enough, the good guys were the Republicans in this. Sheila Baer was a Republican from uh, the Midwest. And she said, look, Citibank is not only insolvent, it's a basically a financial fraud uh, organization. Uh, we should take it over. It doesn't have any money. Uh, on the other hand, but uh, Obama said, wait a minute. Uh, Geithner is a protege of Ron Rubin, of Rubin, 
and uh, he's become uh, head of Citigroup. We've got to bail out a Citigroup. So what uh, Obama did was take the uh, banks that have been the most fraudulent, that have paid the largest amount of civil fines for financial fraud, and said, these are the banks, we want to be the leaders. We're going to make them the biggest banks, and we're going to make them stronger, uh, and uh, we're not going to forgive any loans. Uh, we're going to leave the loans in place, unlike what's happened for the last few hundred years in crashes. And so uh, this crash of 2008, it was not a crash of the banks. The banks were bailed out. The economy was left with all of the junk mortgages, all of the fraudulent debts. Uh, and then to further uh, help the banks recover, the Federal Reserve came in and pushed quantitative easing, uh, lowering the interest rates so much that banks could make an enormous, the, the widest profit they have ever made in history between the lending rates on mortgages, uh, 5 to 6%, student loans, 9%, uh, credit card loans, 11 to 29%, uh, and the bank's borrowing charge, which was 0.1%, the banks became enormous profit, profit centers, leading the stock market gains. Uh, so they were bailed out, and over the weekend, the newspapers say, look at the wonderful success, the stock market's up, the 1% are richer than ever before, let's look at the good side of things, and there's no analysis at all as why the economy is not recovering, and whether this failure to recover is a backwash of the way in which uh, the crisis was handled by bailing out the banks, not the economy. Let me take a step backwards here. First of all, very quickly for us, define quantitative easing. Quantitative easing is uh, when the Federal Reserve uh, created $4.3 trillion of uh, uh, buying uh, all of the bad uh, debts and the bank assets and creating bank reserves, essentially it's like printing money. Uh, and it's printing money, uh, and you've heard the phrase uh, money dropping from helicopters, uh, but the helicopters only fly over Wall Street. So the Federal Reserve created $4.3 billion on the accounts of the banks and let the banks uh, get through the fact that they'd made recklessly bad loans, they'd made reckless losses. Uh, Sheila Baer, in her autobiography, wrote about how Citibank was the most mismanaged bank in America, not quite as fraudulent as uh, 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 Countrywide is, or uh, Bank of America, but uh, simply incompetent by making uh, bad gambles under uh, Prince, uh, who ran the well, thing. Uh, they were bailed out. It, it, uh, sub they were subsidized. Let's talk a bit about what could have been the alternative. And that, to me, that's what the, is, a, is a gripping story we never wrestle with nor talk about very much, right? Isn't that amazing that over the weekend, not a single paper that I know said here, there, there were many alternatives at the time. The alternative that was talked about, uh, mainly by Republicans, was saying, okay, these mortgages were fraudulently written. Uh, that's why the whole uh, uh, media were using the word chunk mortgages. They say uh, we should write down the mortgage to the ability of the mortgager to pay out of 25% of their income or whatever, or the uh, carrying charge for the mortgage would be the same that they could rent. In other words, if someone's paying $600 a month uh, uh, or $1,200 a month in uh, mortgage payments, but for $600 a month, they could rent the house, identical house next door, you would reduce the mortgage to the realistic value because the banks had hired crooked appraisers uh, and uh, their own crooked firms to give false valuations on uh, these uh, loans they made in order to sell them to gullible people like German Landesbanks and, so, and pension companies. So uh, in, in 2008, uh, some, Republic, some Republicans, along with some uh, economists who were to the left of Wall Street were talking about bailing out people who were in debt, bailing out people whose mortgages uh, were, were underwater, uh, dealing with the question of how much we're charging for student loans and, and kind of either putting a freeze on that or, or writing them down. So I mean, let, let's talk a bit about for, for a moment what, could be, what was being proposed that was not paid attention to in 2008 that had to do well, with more, because one of the things you say, uh, which is a pretty radical notion, uh, which is we shouldn't have, we should have bailed out the debtors and not the banks. So let's start there. What does that mean and how does that work? Suppose you had taken the 4.3 uh, trillion dollars uh, and instead of giving it to the banks, 
uh, to lend out mainly to corporate raiders or to speculators or to currency speculators, uh, you would have used this 4.3 uh, trillion to uh, take o buy all of the bad loans at a discount. They could have bought uh, uh, a who's they? You're talking the federal government. Federal government could have bought uh, the junk mortgage loans in default for maybe uh, a quarter of the value. Let's say. $25,000. $25, this is essentially what Blackstone Realty did and what private equity people did, buying the foreclosed properties. The governments could have bought uh, from the banks their bad loans, and instead of foreclosing, they'd write down the loans to the realistic uh, market uh, price that uh, the market was pricing uh, the property and the loans at. Uh, the uh, the inflated housing prices would have been recal uh, recalculated at the market rate. There'd be a lower mortgage. There would be uh, lower uh, interest rates and uh, no penalty payments. And this $4.3 uh, trillion could have spurred an enormous takeoff. It could have left the $9 million, uh, 9 million families that were evicted in place. It could have kept the... Uh, housing prices low for the country. It could have kept uh, the purchasing power of homeowners uh, available to be spending on goods and services, and the economy would have recovered instead of stagnated. That wasn't done because the financial sector was uh, running the uh, Democratic Party's policy uh, and politics, uh, not uh, uh, the voters. All right, so, so, I mean, but they've been doing this for a long time. I mean, whether it was... Uh... President Bush or President Clinton and going after pieces of West Eagle and finally killing it and the rest, which you can talk about in a minute if we have time today. I mean, but, 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 but the issue seems to me, um, people would say to you in response, uh, well, what about the banks? That's where our money is. That's how we get our loans. That's who finances uh, uh, small businesses in our community. How can you not bail them out? How, how can they not be the centerpiece of this along with us whose homes are under underwater? Well, just about everybody who listens to this show has their bank accounts guaranteed by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC. Sheila Baer uh, was the head of the FDIC. She was leading the advocacy to take over the banks and uh, essentially wipe out uh, their stockholders because they were holders in a, a fraudulent organization, wipe out the bondholders, and in her autobiography, she was opposed. She said, we could have taken over Citibank Every insured depositor would have had their money. What does it mean to take over Citibank? What does it mean to take over the banks? What does that mean? That means uh, when there is uh, when the bank is insolvent, the government takes it, it, it over at a price that is uh, large enough to uh, <laughs> to cover the deposits, but or the bondholders. So let's say that one more time for us. So you're saying so the taking of the banks. Would, would, have, would have guaranteed who and not the bondholders? It would have guaranteed the depositors. Depositors. The deposit, uh, there was enough money in Citibank, even though it was crooked, even though it was incompetently managed, even though uh, we know that it's paid uh, tens of billions of dollars for fraud, uh, it would have wiped out uh, the big speculators. Uh, but all of the depositors, the bread and butter uh, users, uh, would have been paid. The same for all the other banks. No depositor would have lost, but the, the bondholders would have lost because uh, the banks uh, essentially would have used their money to pay the depositors uh, and to stay in business, not pay the owners of the banks who were owners of a crooked organization. So where and does the money come from then to invest in infrastructure, in new businesses, and whatever else has to be invested in? Well, banks don't invest. Banks, that's the myth. The, the, the pretense is that rescuing the banks rescued the economy. But the banks don't uh, make loans to the economy. Banks don't make loans to fund factories. They don't make loans for infrastructure. They make loans to buy assets already in place, to privatize infrastructure, to uh, take it private, raise uh, the uh, rates uh, to the, the people have to pay, uh, and essentially uh, the same thing as uh, taking over corporations. They won't help a corporation uh, put in more equipment and hire more people, but they'll lend to a raider to uh, break up a corporation, downsize the labor, for labor force, uh, smash it up, and uh, leave it a bankrupt shell. Uh, that's the financial management plan. That's uh, uh, what they teach in business schools. 
Uh, and uh, uh, the idea that bailing out the banks helps the economy, uh, the, the fact is that the economy today cannot recover without a bank failure. Because if wait, you- wait, 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 let me stop you right there before we go on. So we have, let's examine that for a minute before we have to close. So, so what, do, what do you mean by that? What do you mean the economy cannot let without a bank failure? What does that mean? That mean, uh, the, the banks uh, hold uh, the student loan debt, the mortgage debt, the credit card debt. If you leave all of this debt in place, uh, people will not have enough money after paying their monthly nut, after paying other banks, their mortgage payments, their housing payments, all of the monthly stuff. There's not enough money to buy the goods and services that they produce anymore. So uh, the economy is shrinking. The, uh, you've seen a lot of stories uh, international and national chains going out of business. You've seen whole streets in New York City uh, being basically uh, half, the, uh, half the stores are empty. Uh, nobody's in them. The economy's not recovering. It's limping, limping along. And it's what uh, is called debt deflation. And again, my book, uh, Killing the Host, describes how all of this was described in the 1930s. Uh, it's a well-known phenomenon. Uh, but nobody talking about the rescue was saying, wait a minute, what was rescued was the volume of debt instead of uh, writing it down like you did in the 1930s. So uh, you, essentially, we're not in a recovery at all. Uh, and we can't get in a recovery until you write down the debt. Otherwise, you're going to have the economy looking like Greece. You're going to have austerity. So basically, we're on an austerity budget now, not so much because of tax policy, but because of the debt overhead uh, that is owed to the banks and other uh, major creditors. So we're here talking with Michael Hudson, uh, and it's a fascinating conversation about what could have been and what is not. We're going to come right back to finish this conversation with Michael Hudson uh, here on The Real News Network to briefly talk about what it is we can do and where we are at this moment. So stay with us.